Monday, October the 16th, Committee of the Whole Meeting. Welcome. We have one item on the agenda that is the mid biennial budget update. And presenting this evening are Carrie Roller and Christian Trevallis. Trevallis. Thank you, Councilmember O'Halloran, Council Members. Um, tonight we're going to be providing a mid biennial budget update, which includes just an overview of the proposed budget. There's a few reasons we typically do a mid biennial budget update is we do a biennial budget, a two year budget. And so halfway through that um, two year period, we need to specifically look at the revenue sources for the general fund and true up where we're doing with the initial projections. Um, adjust any revenues that maybe are lagging behind or adjust some revenues um, that are doing better than our projections. We're also doing some housekeeping adjustments to incorporate some prayer council actions, such as when we've received some grant awards, um, adjust from unexpected costs or departmental changes. Part of this budget adjustment will also be to propose the property tax levy ordinance for 2024. So this is the budget calendar that council passed in September. And this just is the layout of what we're going to be doing over the next several weeks in regards to the budget adjustment. So tonight we're just giving an update. And then um, later this evening at the regular council meeting, we'll be doing our first of two public hearings. The second public hearing will be on October 23rd. And then we will come back to the Committee of the Whole on November 6th to finalize a committee report. And then the evening of November 6th, we will do the first reading of the legislation that we need to pass for the budget adjustment and the property tax levy. And then the second and final reading will be on November 13th. This schedule we have laid out is just our proposed calendar. Um, it certainly can be adjusted if needed. Most importantly, though, that the property tax levy has to be communicated to King County no later than November 30th. So the last date we could do the property tax ordinance would be the November 20th date. Other than that, this calendar can be adjusted. So we'll dive into the details. Council has been very conscientious and mindful over the um, past decade about increasing property tax and being careful about how much we assess our residents in regards to property tax. So the one of the slides is showing um, what our rates are for 2023 and how we compare to some of our neighboring cities. Our assessed value is 88 cents or our property tax levy is 88 cents per $1,000 of assessed value. So you can see that we are on the low end of some of our neighboring cities. And then just a reminder that not all of the money that a resident pays comes back to the city. It's less than 10% actually funds back to the city's general fund. For property tax, state allows us to increase the property tax, um, the lesser of 1% or inflation. This year, the inflation is well over 3%, so we are going to just be assessing that 1% limit plus any new construction. That's what's allowed per state law. So the levy that we're estimating to um, assess is $25.8 million, which is about $500,000 more than last year's amount, which is about 13 cents per household increase. These numbers are preliminary figures from King County and they will be subject to change, but we will make sure we update council at that November 6th Committee of the Whole of any final figures before final adoption of the property tax ordinance. The estimated levy rate will increase from 88 cents to about 96 cents. And you may be looking at that thinking, well, that seems like a little bit more of a 1% increase. Why is that? And so the reason is that top line that you see there, the King County assessed value is actually decreased this year. So anytime the assessed value goes down, the levy rate goes up. And anytime the assessed value goes up, the levy rate goes down. Even if we wouldn't have changed the amount that we're levying because the numerator of how that's calculated fluctuates year over year, it will adjust in the levy rate as well. So I wanted to make that clarification because that is a, a bigger jump than maybe just looking at the 1% overall. Um, the next slide is just an overview of our general fund revenues. Um, we're looking to increase over the biennium about $11.4 million. 9.4 for this year and 2 million for next year. And I'll go through these changes individually in the next few slides. So first and foremost, our sales tax. Last year when we were setting our sales tax figures during the biennial budget, you know, we had um, talk of a recession looming. We had high interest rates and high inflation. And so we estimated our sales tax fairly conservatively, a little bit more than 2022. 
The beginning of this year, our sales tax growth was doing great. Um, about May, we started to hit a little bit of a decline in seeing our sales tax growth stall out. So we are kind of getting to that point where we're starting to dip down a little bit this year. Overall, our increase for our sales tax is about 2% this year, which is quite a bit different from the last two years. We were showing growth of 23% and 13% over the last two years. So you can, you can see that how that's starting to stall out and, and lose gain ground a little bit. One of the reasons um, that I am only increasing about $2.5 million budget for this year is a lot of this growth is related to some of our construction, sales tax from construction. So this is um, a slide over the last 10 years just showing the increases or decreases that we've had um, in regards to construction sales tax. And you can see it bounces around a lot just based on what kind of building we're going on in our city at the time. And so this year we're at an overall um, high or projected to be at an overall high of 5.5 million of our sales tax coming from construction within our city. So that's about a 23% increase from last year and 75% increase since 2020. I don't anticipate that next year construction sales tax will be as high, mainly because um, interest rates are so high. And so a lot of builders are holding off, waiting to maybe make some decisions on doing some building and holding off on borrowing money since the interest rates are so high. We're also seeing um, a lower amount of permits being pulled as well. So that really um, supports that projection. So even with um, the standard 2% increase that we're seeing, I'm looking to increase the sales tax about 2.5 this year, about 7% and no change for next year. Um, mainly because some of the se other sectors within the sales tax we're seeing, retail sales actually had a decline of 5%. Wholesale sectors and auto sales are a 15% um, decrease. And so keeping 2024 right where we had it budgeted and um, wait to see how next year goes with that. Let's see here. So our BNO tax is holding very strong. We're proposing to increase our BNO tax $2.5 million for 23 and $1.5 million for 2024. This is largely due to the new BNO BNO tax rate we passed in January of 2023. Um, the biennial budget didn't have this fully accounted for, for and so just um, catching up to what we're seeing, those revenues coming in and uh, projecting them into the next year as well. Because BNO tax mirrors somewhat our sales tax and we are seeing a slight stall or decline in our sales tax. I'm only increasing the BNO tax a little bit, um, 1.5 next year, not the same as this year. Unlike sales tax, you can see the BNO tax has a nice stair step increase year over year. And that's just as a reminder that we changed the um, amount that we are assessing to any one taxpayer in any one year. We're increasing that $2 million per year until we get to 2025, where it tops out at $12 million. So after 2025, you see a more steady increase instead of that nice stair step, stair step up. For utility taxes, this is historically a really strong revenue source for the city's general fund. Um, I'm increasing, looking to increase that about a million dollars for both years, or about 6%. During the pandemic, we saw this decrease just because there was a moratorium on a lot of utility companies that couldn't, could not um, actively pursue payment for past due accounts. With that moratorium lifted, we are seeing um, things get back to pre-pandemic figures and um, adjusting it as such. We have seen some utilities decrease like phone and cable, but we've also seen um, gas utilities and electric utilities increase. So overall, we're going to increase our utility taxes about a million dollars each year. Other revenues to note, our investment earnings are doing really well. I'm looking to increase the budget about $1.6 million for that for 2023. We typically budget around $750,000 to $800,000 per year in investment interest for the general fund. Um, during the pandemic, when the interest rate just went to almost nothing, um, we backed off of our budget. And um, in the last 12 months with that interest rate increasing so quickly, our investment earnings has as well. At this point, I'm planning not to budget or change the budget for 2024. Um, what we're hearing is that the interest rates will probably see one more increase and then in 2024 start to tick down. So um, instead of increasing our, our budget for next year and possibly having money, um, trying to spend money we don't have, just kind of keeping that where it's at. Gambling tax, we're just increasing it 1 million, 1.1 million this year just to catch up to what we're seeing. This is discretionary funds that people use for entertainment. I consider 
typically um, budget for that pretty conservatively. So just adjusting this year, adjusting for grants that we received awards for about 300,000. And then the other category is we've received some donations and catching up some of our leases, our lease, lease facilities. Some of the revenues that are not doing as well as um, projected in the budget, uh, we're looking to decrease our fines and forfeitures about $500,000 and um, this year and about $100,000 next year. And this is really our red light camera tickets and court fines. And so during the pandemic, we saw this kind of bounce around a little bit as well. Um, so we had increased it the last couple of years. So we're just decreasing it back down to what we're seeing coming in right now. The fuel taxes um, decreasing in that about three hundred to four hundred thousand per year. This is a tax that we have seen steadily decline over the last several years, and this is a tax on per gallon sold, not on the price of um, fuel. And so, just less gallons are being sold. Um, therefore, we have a, a lower amount of this revenue source coming in. Um, the taxes for fuel taxes are to be used specifically for transportation staffing, transportation improvements. And so with council approving the transportation benefit district, even more important now when we see this revenue source continuing to decline to um, support that with a, a new revenue source. So on to the general fund expenditures, I'm looking to increase expenditures about $6 million. And I'll go through each one of these individually as well in the next few slides. So we have about $2.6 million of ARPA funding yet to be appropriated. And we received these funds in 2021. We decided to hold some back and wait for further consideration on how we wanted to spend those. We are required to appropriate these funds um, by 2024. So we're starting to get to the point where we're getting close to that deadline. And I'd like to allocate the remainder of these funds so that we do not jeopardize getting to the point where we have to return any of this money to the federal government. I'm strongly recommending um, that we do, as we have done in the past, to recognize this as lost public sector revenue, which means that these funds provide governmental services, such as some of our ongoing costs, um, wages, or anything that we have budgeted right now, to the extent of the reduction in revenue experienced due to, due to the pandemic. So um, the benefit of allocating a large amount to lost public sector revenue is really twofold. This category um, is less restrictive on overall use, and what happens is, is we are enabled to free up general fund money to use for other proposed purposes. So if we recognize these funds as lost um, revenue and free up general fund dollars, um, it could be used for some of the following proposed purposes. I'm proposing to allocate a million dollars for sidewalk improvements. Um, I know that we're working on the transportation benefit district. We originally had hoped that that new tax would be um, in, in effect at the beginning of the year and we would start seeing the new tax generating funds for the city in March. But based, in, based on the timing of the legislation that we have right now, we won't start seeing those tax dollars come in until June based on the timing of when we have to notify the Department of Revenue of the, the rate changes. So I'd like to allocate some of those funds to the sidewalk improvements so transportation department can continue pushing forward on some of the commitments that they have um, planned for next year. I'd also like to allocate $525,000 to human services funding. We know that we still have um, many of our residents in need of support, rental and food support. So allocating some of those funds to programs and resources there. I'd like to allocate $500,000 to citywide cleanup. And this is really overall citywide, um, cleaning up trash, graffiti. I know that we've added some new trash cans in downtown where the, the lids are different so birds can't get in and, and pull some trash out. So, and we've really made a large push um, within our city in the last few years about overall citywide cleanup. And I really would like to continue with those efforts citywide. About $500,000 I'd like to allocate to the Renton Senior Center um, um, HVAC system and roof replacement. Lori Fleming was just here a couple weeks ago to talk about reallocating the CDBG coronavirus funds to the HVAC improvement. And um, it, even with those grant funds, these both of these projects are a little bit short. So just adding a little bit more money so that we can complete that project to full. And then lastly, I would like to allocate the remainder, about 251000 to SEPTED or the Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. And this is really where we clear the shrubbery and trim trees, add lighting, rockery to areas that 
are typically overgrown, dark, or more susceptible to crime. And so we've um, seen where this has really made a big improvement and would like to continue those efforts. Another thing that we are proposing is some departmental reconfigurations. We're looking to reassign the Equity Housing and Human Services Department and its service lines to new and previous departments that have been that have complementary infrastructure and resources. And so the reconfiguration that we're proposing would move human services and neighborhoods to parks and recreation. This would really be a minimal change for this work group, just simply shifting where um, they're reporting to parks and rec, where really senior youth and family services live right now. The housing would go back to CED. The body of work we refer to as affordable housing has structural dependence on being part of our planning efforts on the outset and really needs to be part of the work group of each and every planner. And so what we're proposing to do is we'd like to move the housing positions back to CED and changing one of those to a senior planner. This would also include the rental registration program. Um, we would shift back to CED and be assigned to a planning technician um, who would really be able to work more closely with the code enforcement and the building inspectors. Equity would be elevated and moved to both human resources department and executive department. The body of work will be expanded in the following ways. First, um, the equity manager would move to human resources to really help focus on employee education and also address the Title VI federal requirements that include internal and external pathways of questions and complaints. And, and some of those sometimes involve investigations that need to be resolved. Um, HR has those mechanisms for investigations and has a team of employee um, analysts that would be able to help accomplish that. The second component of expanding the body of work around equity would be to move the community outreach coordinator to the executive department as part of the communications and engagement division. We would, um, this would really provide depth to create civic engagement opportunities and help to focus some of those um, efforts on the inclusive engagement strategic plan. The third component of expanding the body of work around equity would be to move the equity commission to the executive department, really elevating that commission to more of a direct relationship with the mayor's office and city council. And so with these changes, the overall summary, um, this is just the overall summary of all the positions. In total, it would actually save the general fund to over $500,000. Overall, there would just be one decrease in FTE, which would be the administrator position, and the other positions would be moved to other departments and those costs realigned. With the reconfigurations um, and, and the savings from that, we're also proposing to add some positions to some other departments that are needs of some support. We're looking to add a total of 4.5 FTEs. 3.5 of those would be for the general fund, costing about $370,000. Um, even with the with the savings, proposed savings from the reconfiguration, there still would be a net savings of about $200,000. The positions we would be looking to um, add would be a government affairs manager, a limited term construction engineering inspector, a finance position, and converting a limited term half-time HR analyst to a full-time position. We would also be looking to add one airport's maintenance worker for the airport division. Some other general fund expenditures that I'm looking to, that I'm proposing to adjust is increasing funding for our general fund emergency reserve. So our stabilization policy requires that we have 12% set aside of general fund costs. Um, the industry standard has, has changed closer to a two month reserve on hand or about 17%. And so what I would like to do is add about a million dollars to the reserve of just this one-time construction sales tax that we're seeing so high this year to get closer to more of that industry standard um, mark. Also looking to add $2 million for some capital allocations for our parks and facility capital improvements. We're seeing a lot of the bid proposals that are coming in are overestimates. And so allocating some of the extra um, sales tax from construction, the one-time costs that we're seeing to support some of these um, projects as they, some of them are coming up in over budget so they can continue um, funding those to full completion. We have some annual service fees for police body cameras that were not fully appropriated within the biennial budget. So adding that, and also there's just some higher costs with adding staff. Um, we received some grant revenues. So increasing the expenditure side of those grants 
The cost of living increase of $200,000 is for 2024 only. So our union contract with our ASME union stipulated that the CPI or the cost of living increase would be based on June CPI or a total no more than 4.5%. So June CPI was at or above 4.5. We had budgeted 4%, so we just need to adjust our budget that half percent to make up for that, to comply with that union contract. And then other costs are um, essentially some increases in consultant legal fees, increase in fuel costs and supplies with inflation being so high. Some of the decreases I'm proposing is that we fund the left medical retirement fund. And this is really to provide medical for our left one retirees, which also includes long-term disability. So we have an actuary look at this every two years. And um, this last report we just received from the actuary showed that we're definitely getting closer to that funding mark that we've needed. So I'm still um, planning to fund this program, just not as aggressively as we have before. So I'm backing off that funding about a million dollars for each year. This is our long range plan. It's looking very good, much different than we have in the past. I have no concerns with our long range plan and we have a balanced budget. Some other fund adjustments that we're proposing besides the general fund is looking to increase some money for the siting replacement at Don Persons um, Renton Senior Activity Center. I know that we're doing some other improvements there. So um, helping to complete everything on the outside of that building to have it available long term will be good. Also looking to increase our budget for the recognition of several, several grants that we've received um, for both facilities and park improvements, as well as some grants we've received at um, the airport for the Taxiway Alpha Rehab Project and um, Ecology Water Quality Grants. That one's hard to say, um, but we have received a couple grants there as well. So just adjusting the budget for and the offsetting expenditures for those projects. Part of this budget adjustment also includes some adjustments to some fee schedules. We're looking to include our airport hangar and tie down rental rates into our fee schedule that has not been in our fee schedule in the past. We're looking to update some transportation impact fees. And then we also collect fees on behalf of some other agencies where they've asked us to update their fees of um, updating the school impact fees for the school district and updating the fire impact and fire marshal fees for the Renton um, Regional Fire Authority. This is just a summary of all the legislation that we need to pass in the next few weeks. We need to set the property tax levy for 2024 before the end of November. We need to adopt budget legislation and update our fee schedule. So I know that that was a lot of information in a short amount of time, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. I also have many of um, the other administrators from the departments here that can answer any questions that you may have as well. Okay, who wants to go first? Go well, before Ruth gets started. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. I'm saying. I'm saying. Uh, mine, okay, I'll let you. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, uh, <laughs> Madam President. Um, so on um, the uh, um, ARPA-related funding allocations, and this is just you know, out of curiosity, you have these 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 funds, and you know, I understand the uh, replacing the lost public sector revenue and and kind of what you said about that. I'm just curious about you know when you look at the numbers, you could have sliced and diced that a lot of different ways. Um, I, I guess I kind of wrote on here why these ratios. I mean, one could easily say, well, you know, maybe the septet could have uh, gotten more money than the citywide cleanup, or the human services could have gotten. So I'm, I'm curious as to how you kind of ended up at these particular uh, funding numbers for those particular areas. Sure, sure. Um, some of them were just talking to other our other department heads about how much they would need to make an impact. Um, because the, there is $2.6 million, we want to be able to spread it as we can to make an impact. And so in, to in talking with our other administrators, um, they really helped with kind of framing that about what would help to make an impact. Um, the transportation figure, um, that was really looking at that we were expecting to get about $3.5 million and really losing um, three or four months of that, wanting to really make sure that we continued with um, their goal of 
of adding some of those sidewalks and doing that street overlay. So talking with Martin, he said that seemed to make sense with him. And so really it was just talking to our colleagues on how we could make an impact with some of these funds. And certainly open to um, discussion. It's just a, a proposed allocation. Thank you very much. Okay, so in the interest of making sure that everybody has an opportunity to ask their questions, I'm gonna go in order starting from uh, James working this way, one question per person until everybody gets a chance to speak, please. So that the next person would be you, uh, Council Member Vaughn. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the presentation, Carrie. Um, I have a question in terms of, we have a 2.6 million and I know that um, during that time, is it that it's unallocated or there were money reserved for the equity housing human services pending the assessment? I just want to have clarity on um, In my mind, those are two of the same things. We have the we have them unappropriated. Um, originally, when we met back in 2021, we talked about holding them back until we had the human um, services needs assessment completed. And um, so, the $2.6 million is what we still have to appropriate. So, Madam Chair, may I have a follow-up? Or should I just wait? Um, uh, qu quickly, please. Yeah, so from my understanding, unless I heard wrong, then the um, human services community assessment has not been done. So, I, I guess my question is, what is the assessment that we are pressing before the timeline is, is what you're saying? Um, are there uh, are there funds once this is done allocated? Um, are there funds available for whatever needs that comes up from the CUNY assessment? Um, we can certainly change how we allocate these funds. Um, recognizing them as lost public sector revenue is probably the most important thing we need to do right now. After we recognize that and move past on letting the Treasury know this is how we're going to be using it, we can then allocate any of the funds because we're freeing up general fund money to use however we wish. Allocating it based on that lost public sector revenue is probably the most important thing we need to do at this time, in my opinion, and then we can allocate these funds how we need to. We have seen increase in taxes and we certainly could be re-looking at our human services funding um, in December as well. I know that we have made a extensive push in making sure that we have been increasing how much we have been putting to human services over the last three years. And so um, it's definitely been a priority of staff as well as I know council. Thank you, all right. Councilmember Perez. Thank you, Madam President. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was very good. Uh, I have a lot of questions, uh, and I'm going to start with the first one. Uh, it has to do with the reorganization. Um, uh, I appreciate the memorandum of understanding that you guys sent uh, about with a lot of details about the reorganization, but I still have some um, concerns and a need of more information about some of these new, new positions that I I really am struggling in understanding. The Senior Human Resource Analysis, DEI. Uh, I didn't understand the job description and I need to understand better what is that position and how it will help with our goals and mission. More with details. I, I heard what you say briefing right now, what you tried to describe, what is it, but I didn't understand the job description very clearly. Let Ellen feel that one. Good evening. Council, my name is Ellen Bradley Mock. I'm the Human Resources and Risk Management Administrator, and I have a draft job description actually that I've been looking at for quite a, a some time. One of the things that Carrie mentioned is that this position would oversee our Title VI requirements that are uh, required from the federal government anytime you receive federal funding. And while we've never been out of compliance, there's no sense of coordination for that or a centralized uh, area where we can take in complaints, and this is very important. So the role of the senior human resource analyst slash DEI position would be to coordinate that and to handle those complaints. It would also oversee our training program for employees to increase our cultural competency as an organization and to work on workforce culture. It would also be in a position to reach across to our 
external constituents and uh, for recruitment purposes to bring in a diversified workforce to help us improve in that area. It will also oversee um, our human resource uh, tactical inclusion plan that we started several years ago. And it's kind of fallen off the wayside a little bit because we haven't had someone actually focused on working in it. And so um, there's many components to it. I don't know if that helps answer your question. I have other things on this, on this job description that I could talk about. It does, uh, but I, uh, what kind of qualifications are you looking at a person that will fill this kind of position? Well, we always um, encourage someone who has a bachelor's degree and a preferred master's degree in public administration and other kinds of social work, uh, working in, with diversified communities, working with, um, there's degrees out there for um, improving cultural competency for organizations. So we'd be looking for someone with those kinds of qualifications. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to take executive privilege here. Is this position also has been referred to as a equity manager? Is that one in the same that we're talking about here? Because we, I know we had a conversation about ha hiring an equity manager. Is that this person? It is the same FTE, but okay. it is not going to be, uh, if you approve it, it will not be hired as a manager position. It will be a senior human resource analyst position with room to grow to expand the program in future years. Thank you. You're welcome. Council Member Prince. Thank you so much, Madam President. You you took a small piece of my question, which was about the equity manager. Um, I was going to ask, I know when Benita was doing her wrap up, she talked about the hiring of one. I'm assuming we've not hired one. That's correct. Um, and so then my second question as I'm looking at this is, uh, can someone tell me what the government affairs manager is going to do what the, is what their role is going to be are they going to be in olympia are they going to be here managing the person in olympia what exactly is our government affairs manager going to be doing i let our cao answer yes. good evening council that is the other half of doug levy um, so it's going to be regional we still have somebody in olympia with the future to grow with the regional sound transit uh king county regional homeless to stay regional with the uh the things that are going on here so that's the position he will take. That was one of Doug's recommendations when he left, is that he he felt, and we know he didn't, failed us because he couldn't do enough with all the things that were going on in Olympia and regionally. So he was saying that we should probably split that until we could make it grow into something better. Okay, so it's basically going to be the person doing the, the regional stuff that Doug was doing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, again, if I may, clarifying, when regional, we're talking anything below state level. Okay. All right. Okay. Council Member McGurvin. Thank, Thank you, Madam President. Uh, a lot of great questions asked so far. In fact, I would say most of them on my list already asked. So I will ask a follow-up to that one, uh, which was prompted by, by your query there. Would we have someone doing federal work that would be separate from that as well? Is that a third position we'd be looking for at a future date? Or would one of these two positions we currently have be seeking that work? So we have one at Olympia, the contract consultant that we have. That'll continue to do Olympia and federal. And so... So the contract will continue to include federal. Correct. Okay. Until we get this position, grow it. Again, this was based on Doug's recommendation of that world and getting a better handle on how Brenton can best be represented both regionally and uh, at the state level. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me, Council Member Rivera. Thank you. Um, Council President Hall, and I appreciate it. One, thank you for a very comprehensive presentation. My question also alludes to the um, equity manager and the equity commission. Now, no longer the equity manager, forgive me, the, um, the human resources analyst for that. And so I think we were all kind of taken aback with the, with the, the reorganization. And I really, again, love this presentation. And I think when, we, when EHHS was created, it was helped to kind of like be more efficient. But from my impression, equity hasn't really been unified as it has kind of been siloed in its own department. Now, with the Equity Commission going to the executive office and this manager or this analyst position going to HR, how will these two intersect or work together? And how, and how will the definition of equity become more quantitative than qualitative as a result? Oh, that's a really good question. It's action-packed. 
I heard three parts. I'm not exactly sure, honestly, how the uh, Human Resources Analyst will intersect with the Equity Commission, but I can guess that it will be making presentations to the Commission, asking for their input on our tactical plan and other initiatives. We used to use the Mayor's Inclusion Task Force like that. And so I would guess that we would move that kind of work to the Equity Commission. Uh, I think that they're a very serious group of individuals, and I think that they would really help elevate the level and the, the quality of our, our tactical plan for diversifying our workforce and for creating new partnerships out there in the city of Renton, all of which is really important for our workforce. You bet. Out Mary Jane Van Cleve. Um, I'll compliment that statement. It was actually a statistic that Ellen told me. 40% of our staff have been with the city for less than two years. And we also have several staff members that are celebrating 30 and 40 years. So we have a massive contrast in terms of our equity values and belief, as well as um, the need to transition to operationalizing equity in terms of providing tools and uh, resources so each staff member understands how to execute their role through that lens. In terms of interfacing with the Equity Commission, they're an amazing board. I've thoroughly, thoroughly have enjoyed supporting them. Um, I think what will come out of there is their review um, through the mayor's office expectations. And they have essentially become the equity lens. So basically they could provide the referrers um, on anything presented and then requesting that accountability. In terms of connecting those two bookends, I think what we will need to do is some sort of interdepartmental team that allows departments an opportunity to reflect on their efforts where they need resources, as well as establishing a baseline as a department or each department. But I think we're at that cusp of evolving our equity work in terms of creating standards and measurements so that we are able to present those to council as well as the public. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering all of that. I do appreciate you. Uh, Christy, you look poised. Uh, just in addition to that, because the outreach coordinator will be coming into the executive office, we'll have the body of work there is the inclusive engagement strategic plan. And part of that is data collection, data collection, assessment, analysis of how we're getting out into the community and the civic engagement element. So there's going to be a natural interplay between the equity commission, the equity team that will be interdepartmental, and that's how we operate. Uh, anything out of the executive services department is naturally an all department hands on deck kind of team. So that is going to, that's the third component, I guess, of the, the expansion of equity throughout the, the city. So just want to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Mr. Alberson. I will defer to Council Member Pat as my question is. Oh, I'm sorry, Dan. Council Member Vellon. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a lot of questions. I think for me, it's uh, you know, we just went through a reorganization process and here we are going through again. I just, the from the work that I've seen is really we haven't given the funding, the resources to another department that we really want to emphasize on because we saw gaps. So I think there is a huge issue in terms of that. But to ask the next question, I want to know what is the authority that the senior HR analyst or equity manager will have in actually not as in holding different departments accountable to the standards of equity work or to, but at least to give it more emphasis, right? Because what I see is when you have different departments doing things and we're trying to do it citywide, I just think there's this lack of reinforcement or there's lack of um, opportunity it's just, yeah, is there authority for the senior HR analyst once they take the um, report from the different departments or from the equity commission, working with them to actually see that's follow through? I'd be happy to answer that question. The authority comes up through my position, the Human Resources and Risk Management Administrator and then on through the senior, the, 
the chief administrative officer and our mayor. And we'll be working collaboratively with each department head, and I will be supporting that position through their work. I don't know if that helps answer your question, but that's how the authority works through. I'm looking at you this way because <laughs> I can see you through this. I realized that it was a change from a manager. It was a manager of no one. It was just a manager of a program. And so what we thought after two years of analysis and looking at it, that really equity needs to be a thread that we weave through every single thing that we do at the city of Renton. And so a senior human resource analyst focused on doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work isn't someone who's going to do it by themselves. They're going to do it with the support of our department, and they're going to do it with the support of all of my colleagues, our other administrators. And so the authority for them to, if I understood your question right, if their authority to impose or, or impact programming will be there as part of their body of work up through me and through the support of the mayor's office. Madam Chair, can I have a follow-up? Um, I'm sorry, Kim. We're starting to run out of time. I want everybody to get through. Okay, Councilmember Perez. Uh, Madam Chair, if may I, um, may I suggest that with all the following questions that we will have, if we need more time, we can move these to a following meeting? That is correct. Yes, thank you. We do have an opportunity to schedule more time on this, if need be. That's not the preference. We, we really do want to stick with the calendar that we've published. Um, but if necessary, we can schedule another Committee of the Whole, or please feel free always to submit your questions to staff through the CAO to be um, addressed directly. Thank you, Madam President. I will not feel comfortable to take in time of any council members that have questions because I have a lot. So, um, But thank you for giving me your your turn. <laughs> um, I, I, I still have questions about the government affairs manager position. Um, this position, it, what I'm understanding is going to be the lobbies at regional. So we're going to have two different lobbies. One lobby that does federal and, 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 and state, and okay. another one does those regional. I understand that a lot of cities have the same, the same procedure. However, what I want to know is cities our size, uh, how many of them have them and how much they pay for each one of them? Because we're allocating 123,000 uh, approx for this position, plus what we're paying for our lobbies in the legislation. How much that add, those positions, how much is going to be, and how much other cities our size are paying for that? Thank you. I can find out. Yeah, this came from Redmond, so we can take a look at what that was. And the offset, that 120 number that you mm -hmm. are looking at, that is taking away the contract we have with Mr. Levy. So, I do understand, but so, Mr. Levy used to do uh, the three of them, and the and correct. the and his salary, if I remember correctly, was around one sixty thousand. But later we bumped it up. So this will be between the two lobbies. It's going to be almost double. So I want to make sure that I am correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Prince. Yes, thank you so much, Madam President. Um, so my question, uh, and be my last question uh, of the night, is many moons ago, I did work in SEPTED. Um, I was a SEPTED manager. And so my question is, is SEPTED going to be handled by all departments, or is SEPTED going to be handled by a certain department? How are we going to be doing the SEPTED work? Thank you. Um, it is going to be department or agency wide, but Parks and Recreation will be a lead considering the amenities and resources that it has. Um, and so in talking to Carrie, the capacity and the staffing is is limited, but we do understand it's a priority. So this was to support that group yet. We're really lucky within the city to have um, Sandra Havelock be in the police department and be in kind of her advanced training. She sits on the state board. So every department will have a role, but Parks and Recreation will be a lead in that role. Thank you, MJ. Thank you, sir. Okay. Councilmember McCurvey. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I, I have probably more comments at this point, so I will defer my question as well to make sure others get to ask them. If I have others, I'll ask them offline. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for uh, thank you for that, Councilmember Kirvin, because I do have another question. Um, kind of pertains to what Councilmember um, Van said about 
not allowing enough time for this dep- this department to to grow. And after speaking with a couple of administrators, I understand the reasoning behind the d- the dissolution reconfiguration of this reorganization. And I'm curious if the conversations around developing a strategic plan with measurable outcomes has been brought up because to my understanding, our business plan is more aspirational because we don't really have a lot of um, tangibles and data and measurable outcomes. And even when it comes to this presentation, I don't see how it ties to our business plan, right? It's not overt or clear, especially to our residents. And I think a strategic and can help maybe navigate these things going further in the future because from the impression I'm getting is that EHHS, it was a good idea in theory, maybe a little reactive to some things that we're, we were dealing with. And in practice hasn't been the most effective. And so to avoid, you know, this kind of back and forth in the future or this, you know, and obviously we love to learn, right? Everything's a learning curve. Um, but what about a strategic plan? Can we get one of those going? What do you think? Anyone? <laughs> I, th- I think we have one through your division, Christine. We have a strategic plan in almost every department, yeah. each work group. And so what goals were set there would be the body of work is only going to grow. So what was started in the HHS will be carried into all the departments and they will be including them in their strategic goals. So in e- uh, executive services, we have one. I know uh, Parks and Rec has one and each group does that annually updating their goals and objectives based on the needs the outcomes and metrics that's something that i'll be very excited to share with you very soon because we're working on that data and that is part going to be part of our next budget process is showcasing the updated and refresh refreshed metrics and the way we can display them so yes. i appreciate that i'm so yeah. sorry i wasn't clear i mean a citywide strategic plan i know each department comes up with their own but i'm talking about weaving those together to create a citywide I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. Ideally, if we're not doing it, then we can do a better job of it. But every one of our strategic plans in each division is pointing towards our aspirational goals. So if we're all doing our job, we are all working together. There's a lot of things we do together towards those goals, and they should look very cohesive. And if there are things that are butting up against each other, that's where that's our job as administrators to work those through. So said yep i hope that answered your question <laughs> it does thank you okay i think we're coming around to the home stretch here so we're going to go around one more time <clears throat> and again uh please just one question per and mr alberson Fine. okay council member vaughn yes thank you madam chair um another question in terms of the uh, equity commission and the mayor's inclusion task force if um if when approved then the two will be under the uh, services division what are the differences in work that the two bodies are doing because and the reason i ask that is because i've heard from mayor inclusion task force members and the way it's been restructured and the work that they're doing is a little bit different than what it was and I know it goes back to the formation of the Equity Commission that we had a discussion at council retreat and all council member Prince also mentioned back then of how, this is like probably in 2020, 2019, of how we use the two entities effectively and not necessarily having, you know, in some ways tokenizing communities. So I guess my question is, what is the direct role for the actual role and uh, objectives of each entity, which is the Mayor's Inclusion Task Force and the Equity Thank you for the question. Um, so for the Mayor's Inclusion Task Force, it did shift um, to get back to kind of the basics of what it was for- formed for, which was communication. Communication, two-way dialogue with communities that we were not reaching or were having trouble reaching. That is now, they're, they're refocused on that. What's exciting about the this reconfiguration is if we add the engagement aspect of it, we'll be able to line up 
the engagement coordinator with the inclusion task force and they can work really closely together. And that would be a wonderful combination. The equity commission will be and is designed to be the work, the workhorse, the body that reviews policies, systems, anything we are doing as a city, the institution of the city can be looked at by this commission. So they're more the workhorses of the um, all of our committees and commissions where the inclusion task force they're our conduit and how we're doing and we want to hear through them so there is a very distinct difference i'm very excited about it um, and i think this alignment will be really beneficial to make them both even more effective yeah okay thank you <clears throat> council, yeah. council member perez thank you I'm going to do a little bit of follow up of my question before I ask my question, just because I want to clarify. I sometimes don't think very clearly when I am under pressure, <laughs> but uh, uh, I remember that in 2018, 2019, we moved to a full time position, if it's called that way, for the lobbyists. They, 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 they promised at that time that we were going to have a lobbyist that was going to work just for the city of Renton. And he was going to take care of the federal, the, the, the state and the regional. And that was the contract at the time that we approved. I don't remember exactly the general fund impact, but I remember that was substantial. And the compromise at the time to, to do that, because it was a hard take, you know, it was we were paying more than any other city because most cities have divided this was because how much it was going to overtake. At the end of the day, this was very well money spent, spent because we have a full time employee. So the only questions that I have about this is that right now the lobbies that we have at federal and state level is not working full time just for the city of Renton. Right. It's someone that is working with other cities plus. So we lost that capacity and now we're going to have another employee. What I really want to understand better is how having these two lobbies if the fiscal impact is going to be again substantial, I really want to know. Um, even though other cities have it, I want to know comparatively with cities our size, how much are they investing in this software to see um, uh, to, to see in general if this is a good investment for our taxpayers' money. Sure. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And my question. This is my question. Sorry. <laughs> Not I there. Don't do, I tell you. I don't do well when I'm pressure, okay? This was to clarify my previous uh, question because I feel very pressure. So this is my question, okay? Please, Madam President, okay? I'm following parliamentary procedure. You are the, the president and I'm gonna Eight minutes. defer to you. Very quickly. No, you go ahead with others and then if you have time, come back to me. If not, we can. I can ask my question during the public hearing. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, Council Member Prince. Yes, I, so, all the talk about the inclusion task force and the equity commission did give me a question. Um, and I guess it's, so one of the things that I've been saying since we created the equity commission, um, as coming from the planning commission uh, world and the planning commission has a work plan that the council gets to see, I think it would be helpful for us as a council if we were able to see what the equity commission's work plan was so it doesn't, so that not that they're doing their work in a vacuum, but that so that we, if we get asked questions, we're not caught flat footed and have better information about what's happening with the equity commission. Um, that was I identified gap is bridging the relationship and the feedback, not only the work plan, but the feedback from the commissioners presented to staff back to council. And so we did struggle. Um, we did develop their work plan with them based on tangible information that we needed to present in front of them several staff had projects and plans but the idea and the intent is by elevating it to the executive office is that there'll be that tie-in to at least the council president the mayor and our cao to close that loop um, because they're very proud of their work as well and we do apologize we will be providing an end of the year summary of the feedback they've been giving to every department and what presentations have been presented thus far um, they're very interested in developing their work plan for next year i just have not discussed any of this with them yet because i personally have enjoyed it and didn't want to distract from the work that they're doing. So we'll provide you a summary for it so you can see, and then we will kick off next year with that transparency of their proposed work plan. That would be fantastic. Thank you, MJ. Mm -hmm. 
Councilmember McCurbin. Yeah. Yes, thanks. Um, so the, I did think of another question uh, sitting here that I thought I would ask uh, and make sure I phrase it correctly. I think others have expressed some concern about this uh, reorganization or kind of undoing. I think I, I was a fan of honestly. Um, and so when I'm looking at it and tell me if I'm oversimplifying, it kind of feels like we're, we're reforming community services absent facilities. Like it's just going back to that. So I, the question I want to ask out of that is uh, Benita Horn left us with a very good list of next steps to implement. So who specifically within the administration is taking the lead on that work? I'll touch on a few things. It's not dissolving the work. It is repurposing and making sure adequate resources and authority are with it. Um, I think the reconfiguration was to present and remove and elevate all of the subject matters and bodies of work that council had requested provide added attention and detail and specificity to. And so during that time, it's been a rough year in terms, I don't think I've ever wanted to be a part of a moving staff around. A lot of um, individuals have worked and are very close to the body of work that we do. So it was not done with a faint of heart or um, lack of consideration for that. It is moving, but it is not dissolving. The intent was to repurpose and, um, ex and provide better framework for that. So in terms of the Benita work, we do have her plan and she did provide us a lot of building blocks to build off of, but a majority of that still needs to go into human resources under that position in order to build upon. A lot of it was based on training in terms of what she recommended. I think the Equity Commission is still that guiding um, structure and body of feedback that provides um, those the next stretch because okay you've done your best you have your tools here or we're still identifying some gaps and they ask really profound questions in that sense from an adaptability standpoint a digital gap an equity standpoint as well as looking at our city's demographics in terms of consideration so I hope that helps thank you Councilmember Rivera Thank you, Council President. My question pertains to the executive outreach position. And I want to speak into a little bit of uh, just a little bit of context. When I speak to historically, I mean, as someone who was born and raised in this community, who has seen all the way back to the days of, you know, Mayor Tanner and many, many, many moons ago. All right. And so historically, we have seen different communities have the ear of the executive's office based off what they know. Right. Some communities are more familiar with government actions and bureaucracy, public meetings, et cetera, et cetera. What data and tools are going to be implemented to, with the, com the community outreach position to ensure that all communities are heard equitably, not just the loudest voices in the room and the people who are most well known or know the executive team the best? Well, I think first and foremost will be relationships will be built um, and expanded on. We have a number of tools that have been just limited by capacity. We have we started the digital engagement, the Bang the Table project. Um, we've moved that into the communications and engagement just recently to expand on that. So that's a digital divide um, situation where if they don't have access to that, then we have another step to take. And that's something that when we look at the effectiveness, so having metrics will be huge for this role. It'll be who are we reaching out to, what are the communities we want to reach, and who aren't we reaching out to. There will be crossover with the Inclusion Task Force, absolutely, to make sure that even expanding the Inclusion Task Force is part of this process of expanding. So the tools are relationship building, all of the tools of engagement. We have a lot of opportunity for building out civic engagement opportunities, going to where people are to have a uh, get to know your city, have policy and pints conversations. We've, we've talked about a lot of engagement opportunities that are unique that we can do with this coordinator position so that it's unique to the community. They want, we're going where they are and we're also engaging with them in a way that is meaningful. Um, I don't know everything at this point of what we would do, and that is the beauty of it. We need to keep asking the questions and keep using the data to find more questions to ask, but also to get out there and build relationships um, in new ways, not limited to any box. 
anything is on the table because it's it's changing all the time. So as far as tools go, we've got a ton of tools. We've got some we can use. We have some we don't even know about yet. We have a lot of people who are getting trained in, in public engagement and all those different variations of how that can be done effectively. Um, and that'll be kind of the culture of the whole department and then throughout the city Thank engagement. You. Thank you. Oh, can I add to that? We do have the, the in, in, inclusive engagement infrastructure strategic plan and that has several years of um, milestones and things and that's something we're going to be taking to the equity commission see okay here's our plan to be more inclusive in our engagement what are we missing so, thank you hope that answers yep okay i'm going to bring this to a close um, by asking council um, very quickly go around the room the way we have been do you think your remaining questions can be handled by an email response to all of us? Or do you think you need another Committee of the Whole? Mr. Alberson. Email response. Kim Kahn Vaughn. Um, I would appreciate another Committee of the Whole. Thank you. Councilmember Perez. I will ask if it's okay to ask this question during the public hearing today. The remaining questions. Council meeting doesn't have a time to, to end and finish. I, I literally do not know the answer to that. I would have to defer to Jason and, and Shane. It's completely up to the council as to whether you want to open up discussion during the public hearing. I'm personally not comfortable having an internal conversation in front of the public. But I mean, in terms of taking up council time, council committee, council up. Council meeting time, but if that is the wish of the council, we can do the vote again. Madam President, if you don't feel comfortable, I will support whatever your decision is, but uh, I will feel very comfortable during the public hearing because it's the same setting at the okay. end of the day. So it's not my decision, it's our decision. Council Member Prince. I, I'm, I don't have any other questions. If I do, I can email them, but I, I support. I mean, so here, we always whenever we do a public hearing we ask if the council has questions okay so if okay. council member perez has questions that come okay. up during the public hearing thank you for clarifying i was not i'm not i'm 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 a newbie here <laughs> you're good you're doing great <laughs> mr mcgarvin I, I agree with council member prince okay council member rivera um, I would be inclined to have it. Uh, my first choice would be doing public comment, like uh, Councilmember Perez has suggested, and then doing a second committee of the whole and emailing me being my last choice because for the public to see our questions, they would have to make a public records request. For the first two options, the public can just view it on YouTube, which I think is much more accessible and transparent. Okay. All right. So that looks to me like it's four to three for questions during public hearing. So that's the way we're going to go because this is a democracy. So. I thank you all very kindly for your time. The presentation was terrific. Yes. Um, please, um, staff who are involved in this, please stick around for the public hearing. So thank you, and we are adjourned. <laughs>